This is a slightly unusual request, said Dr. Wagner with what he hoped was commendable restraint. As far as I know, it's the first time anyone's been asked to supply a Tibetan monastery with an automatic sequence computer. I don't wish to be inquisitive, but I should hardly have thought your establishment had much use for such a machine. Could you explain just what you intend to do with it? Gladly, replied the Lama, readjusting his silk robes and carefully putting away the slide rule he'd been using for currency conversions. Your Mark V computer can carry out any routine, any mathematical routine, especially involving up to ten digits. As we wish you to modify the output circuits, the machine will then be printing words, not columns of figures. I don't quite understand. This is a project on which we've been working for the last three centuries, since the Lamasery was founded, in fact. It's somewhat alien to your way of thought, so I hope you will listen with an open mind while I explain it. Naturally. It's really quite simple. We've been compiling a list which shall contain all the possible names of God. I beg your pardon? We have reason to believe, continued the Lama imperturbably, that all such names can be written with not more than nine letters in an alphabet we have devised. And you've been doing this for three centuries. Yes, we expected it would take us about 15,000 years to complete the task. Oh, Dr. Wagner looked a little dazed. Now I see why you wanted to hire one of our machines. But exactly what is the purpose of this project? The Lama hesitated for a fraction of a second, and Wagner wondered if he had offended him. If so, there was no trace of annoyance in the reply. Call it ritual if you like, but it's a fundamental part of our belief. All the many names of the Supreme Being, God, Jehovah, Allah, and so on, they are only man-made labels. There is a philosophical problem of some difficulty here, which I do not propose to discuss, but somewhere along, somewhere among all the possible combinations of letters that can occur, are what one may call the real names of God. By systematic permutation of the letters, we've been trying to list them all. I see. So you've been starting at AAA and working up to ZZZ? Exactly, though we use a special alphabet of our own. Modifying the electromatic typewriters to deal with this is, of course, trivial. A rather more interesting problem is that of devising suitable circuits to eliminate ridiculous combinations. For example, no letter must occur more than three times in succession. Three? Surely you mean two. Three is correct. I'm afraid it would take too long to explain why, even if you did understand our language. I'm sure it would, said Wagner hastily. Go on. Luckily, it will be a simple matter to adapt your automatic sequence computer for this work, since once it has been programmed properly, it'll permutate each letter in turn and print the result. What would have taken us 15,000 years, it will be able to do in a few hundred days. Dr. Wagner was scarcely conscious of the faint sounds from the Manhattan streets far below. He was in a different world, a world of natural, not man-made, mountains. High up in the remote areas, these monks had been patiently at work, generation after generation, compiling the lists of meaningless words. Was there any limit to the follies of mankind? Still, he must give no hint of his inner thoughts. The customer is always right. There's no doubt, replied the doctor, that we can modify Mark V to print lists of this nature. I'm much more worried about the problem of installation and maintenance. Getting out to Tibet in, in these days is, isn't going to be easy. We can arrange that. The components are small enough to travel by air. That is one reason why we chose your machine. If you can get them to India, we will provide transport from there. Er, uh, and you want to hire two of our engineers? Yes, for the three months that the project should occupy. I've no doubt that personnel can manage that, Dr. Wagner scribbled a note on his desk pad. There are just two other points. Before he could finish the sentence, the Lama had produced a small slip of paper. This is my certified credit balance at the Asiatic Bank. Thank you, it appears to be, uh, adequate. 
The second matter is so trivial that I hesitate to mention it. It's, uh, it's surprising how often the obvious gets overlooked. What source of electrical energy have you? A diesel generator providing 50 kilowatts at 110 volts. It was installed about five years ago and is quite reliable. It's made life at the Lamasery much more comfortable, but of course it was really installed to provide power for the motors driving the prayer wheels. Of course, echoed Dr. Wagner, I should have thought of that. The view from the parapetet was vertiginous, but in time one gets used to anything. After three months, George Hanley was not impressed by the 2,000-foot swoop into the abyss or the remote checkerboard of fields in the valley below. He was leaning against the wind-smooth stones and staring morosely at the distant mountains whose name he had never bothered to discover. This, thought George, was the craziest thing that had ever happened to him. Project Shangri-La. <laughs> Some wit back at the labs had christened it. For weeks now, the Mark V had been churning out acres of sheets covered with gibberish. Patiently, inexorably, the computer had been rearranging letters in all their possible combinations, exhausting each class before going on to the next. As the sheets emerged from the electromatic typewriters, the monks had carefully cut them up and pasted them into enormous books. In another week, heaven be praised, they would be finished. Just what obscure calculations had convinced the monks that they needn't bother to go on to words of 10, 20, or 100 letters, George didn't know. One of his recurring nightmares was that there would be some change of plan and that the High Lama, who they naturally called Sam Jaff, though he didn't look a bit like him, would suddenly announce that the project would be extended to approximately AD 2060. They were capable of it. George heard the heavy wooden door slam in the wind as Chuck came out onto the parapet beside him. As usual, Chuck was smoking one of his cigars that made him so popular with the monks who, it seemed, were quite willing to embrace all the minor and most of the major pleasures in life. That was one thing in their favor. They might be crazy, but they weren't blue noses. Those frequent trips they took down to the village, for instance. Listen, George, said Chuck urgently. I've learned something that means trouble. What's wrong? Isn't the machine behaving? That was the worst contingency George could imagine. It might delay his return, and nothing could be more horrible. The way he felt now, even the sight of a TV commercial would seem like mana from heaven. At least it would be some link with home. No, it's nothing like that. Chuck seated himself on the parapet, which was unusual because normally he was scared at the drop. I've just found what all this is about. What do you mean? I thought we knew. Sure, we know that the monks are what they're trying to do, what they're up to, but we didn't know why. It's the craziest thing. Tell me something new, growled George. But old Sam's just come clean with me. You know the way he drops in every afternoon and watches the sheets roll out? Well, this time he seemed rather excited, or at least as near as he'll ever get to it. When I told him we were on the last cycle, he asked me in that cute English accent of his, if I'd ever wondered what they were trying to do, I said, sure, and he told me. Go on, I'll buy it. Well, they, they believe that when they have listed all of his names and uh, they recognize that there are about nine billion of them, God's purpose will be achieved. The human race will have finished what it was created to do, and there won't be any point in carrying on. Indeed, the very idea is something like blasphemy. Then what do they expect us to do? Commit suicide? There's no need for that. When the list's complete, God steps in and simply winds things up. Bingo. Oh, I get it. When we finish our job, it'll be the end of the world. <laughs> Chuck gave a nervous little laugh. That was what I said to Sam. And you know what happened? He looked at me in a very queer way. Like I'd been stupid in class and said... It's nothing as trivial as that. George thought this over for a moment. That's what I call taking the wide view, he said presently. But what do you suppose we do about it? I don't see that it makes the slightest difference to us. 
After all, we already knew that they were crazy. Yeah, but don't you see what may happen? When the list's complete and the last trump doesn't blow, or whatever it is they expect, we may get the blame. It's our machine they've been using. I don't like the situation one little bit. I see, said George slowly. You've got a point there. This sort of things happened before, you know. When I was a kid down in Louisiana, we had a crackpot preacher who once said the world was going to end next Sunday. Hundreds of people believed him, even sold their homes. Yet nothing happened. They didn't turn nasty as you'd expect. They just decided that he'd made a mistake in his calculations and went right on believing. I guess some of them still do. Well, this isn't Louisiana, in case you hadn't noticed. There are just two of us and a hundred of these monks. I like them. I'll be sorry for old Sam when his life work backfires on him, but all the same, I wish I was somewhere else. I've been wishing that for weeks. There's nothing we can do until the contract's finished and the transport arrives to fly us out. Of course, said Chuck thoughtfully, we could always try a bit of sabotage. Like hell we could. That would make things worse. Not the way I meant. Look at it like this. The machine will finish four days from now on the present 20 hours a day basis. The transport calls in a week. Okay. And then all we need to do is find something that needs replacing during one of the overall periods. Something that will hold up the work for a couple of days. We'll fix it of course, but not too quickly. If we time matters properly, we can be down at the airfield when the last name pops out of the register. They won't be able to catch us then. Mm, I don't like it, said George. It will be the first time I ever walked out on a job. Besides, it would make them suspicious, no? No, I'll sit tight and take what comes. I still don't like it, he said seven days later as the tough little mountain ponies carried them down the winding road. And don't you think I'm running away because I'm afraid. I'm just sorry for those poor old guys up there and I don't want to be around when they find what suckers they've been. I wonder how Sam will take it. It's funny, replied Chuck. But when I said goodbye, I got the idea he knew we were walking out on him. And that he didn't care because he knew the machine was running smoothly and the job would soon be finished. After that, well, of course for him, there just isn't any after that. George turned in his saddle and stared back up the mountain road. This was the last place from which he would get a clear view of the Lamastery. The squat, angular buildings were silhouetted against the afterglow of the sunset. Here and there lights gleamed like portholes in the side of an ocean liner. Electric lights, of course, sharing the same circuit as the Mark V. How much longer would they share it? wondered George. Would the monks smash up the computer in their rage and disappointment? Or would they just sit down quietly and begin their calculations all over again? He knew exactly what was happening up on the mountain at this very moment. The High Lama and his assistants would be sitting in their silk robes, inspecting the sheets as the junior monks carried them away from the typewriters and passed them into the great volumes. No one would be saying anything. The only sound that would be heard is the incessant patter, the never-ending rainstorm of the keys hitting the paper, for the Mark V itself was utterly silent as it flashed through its thousands of calculations a second. There she is, called Chuck, pointing down into the valley. Ain't she beautiful? She certainly was, thought George. The batter old DC-3 lay at the end of the runway like a tiny silver cross. In two hours, she would be bearing them away to freedom and sanity. It was a thought worth savoring, like a fine liqueur. George let it roll around in his mind, and the pony continued to trudge patiently down the slope. The swift night of the high Himalayas was now almost upon them. Fortunately, the road was very good as the roads went in that region, and they were both carrying torches. There was not the slightest danger, only a certain discomfort from the bitter cold. The sky overhead was perfectly clear and ablaze with the familiar, friendly stars. At least there would be no risk, George thought, of the pilot being unable to take off because of weather conditions. That had been his only remaining worry. 
He began to sing, but gave up after a while. This vast arena of mountains, gleaming like whitely hooded ghosts on every side, didn't exactly encourage such ebullience. Presently, George glanced at his watch. Should be there in an hour, he called back over his shoulder to Chuck. Then he added in an afterthought, I wonder if the computer's finished its run. It was due about now. Chuck didn't reply, so George swung around in his saddle. He could just see Chuck's face, a wide oval turned towards the sky. Look, whispered Chuck and George lifted his eyes to heaven. There is always a last time for everything. Overhead, without any fuss, the stars were going out. So that was Nine Billion Names of God by Arthur C. Clarke, the famous, famous science fiction writer. And uh, before we get into breaking down uh, my views on, on what exactly the meaning behind it is, I just want to give a brief shout out to a um, supporter of the channel, Ben Wickoff Shore. He just wrote his first novel, and I'm a huge um, supporter of artists and people taking risks and I mean, just having the discipline to write an entire novel. This one's called Terribolita. Terribolita. It's a... It's a term used, according to one person, um, for indie reader. It's uh, to describe a piece, how a piece of art evokes emotion from a viewer, be it awe, terror, or a subtler reaction even. Good art makes you feel. And that's so true. Author Ben Wickoff Shore delivers plenty of thrills, chills, and romance in this novel, but um, I guess a quick summary would be the uh, the rebel caprices of Enzo Ferrando have dire consequences. His father, the Risorgimento war hero, is gunned down on his veranda. His son Luca is then forced into hiding as a deckhand on a merchant ship. Enzo himself is conscripted into the Italian army and forced to wage war on the African Horn, yet he yearns to take vengeance for his father's killers and to reunite with his son. Set in the second half of the 19th century, Terribilita is a coming-of-age tale about family and examination about the redemptive power of violence. In this drum-tight historical fiction novel, readers will encounter Bashi Bazouk, mercenaries, blackbirding pirates, Ethiopian army hordes, and historical figures of the era. One reviewer um, wrote, it's available on Amazon, by the way, Terribilita, was an absolute joy to read, and I didn't want to put it down for a second. The author does an outstanding job of giving his readers a vivid picture of the late 1800s Italy and filling it with a suspenseful tale and appealing characters. And I'm actually in particular a big fan of historical fiction. I love I, I love learning about the world, I, but I also love you know the the creative license that fiction allows um, and, and it really does add richness when when the author is adept at understanding psychology real psychology and um, they can let that the interactions between imaginative characters play out in their head in a, a historically historically based setting so not only do you get to really immerse yourself in a period of history but um, it also tells you um, a lot about the human being, just our psychology and the human condition. And, uh, you know, great fiction is valuable because it lends, um, it gives advice for uh, us how to act in real world situations, how to carry ourselves, what sort of personality traits we'd like to achieve, you know, what, uh, what we admire, what we admonish. And um, so I just want to shout them out and uh, I'll put a link below. So now let's uh, let's get into the nine billion names of God, the context of it, what I 
think it means a sort of amateur analysis of it and um, yeah try to maybe help flesh it out because I know I had some questions especially about that ending so while it might not even seem very deep or uh, significant profound uh, at first read first sight the actual ending of that story the fact that the monks patience the monks um, extreme virtue of uh, three centuries of patience and the subsequent certainty that arose out of that and of course everything that um, knowing what lamas uh, and I'm, I'm equating monks with lamas uh, like the Dalai Lama yeah, I, and I don't know much about them but the the context of a very patient monk like individual and and what that says about their their personality and worldview and um, it, it it's very informative as to what he might have meant by the the ending of that 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 abrupt ending of the story where once you consider the the mysteriousness of the human mind the the complexity of which hasn't been matched by any other scientific discovery yet known to humankind. Spending entire lives and entire generations, series, uh, generation after generation, um, entire lineages for, like they said, 300 years, and of course, well beyond that, is probably one of the most productive insightful things uh, regarding the nature of the universe and ultimately the universe being going hand in hand with God because once we get self revelation that tells us being as, as we are beings of the universe our own nature gives us insight into the nature of the universe as a whole I mean when you get down to our fundamental units of our brains you go to cells and we reach atoms and then we recognize that all matter is frozen energy it's it's um and so if you take that that view of um, you know our material bodies and, and the emerging property of consciousness coming out of our you know bodies that are composed of uh, nothing unique in the universe I mean we are an accumulation a uh, it's really just the order the order and the organization of the atoms that make our DNA which informs what our uh, cells and the rest of our organs are going to evolve into and so um, in other words, who's to say? You know, uh, Arthur C. Clarke was actually a very technically and scientifically educated man himself. And um, it says a lot. I know he lived in, I think, Sri, Sri Lanka. So he was very interested and in, in touch with Asian, or, or we'll just say non-European, African-Asian cultures. And um, he recognized there is a lot of wisdom. There's a lot of self-knowledge to be gained through uh, introspection. Of course, he, one of the brilliant aspects of that story is he's able to show the symbiosis of the enlightened monks and the rational scientists. The monks needed, the lamas needed their... Um, machine to speed up their calculations and you know perhaps in a way um, the hyper efficiency of the machine <laughs> even though the story was I think written in the 50s so they were saying thousands of calculations a second which is uh, laughable nowadays because now we have machines that do uh, literally do trillions of calculations per second um, billions Per second is the norm and uh, perhaps if the monks wouldn't have jumped at the impulse 
to capitalize on the, the machine's efficiency, they might have, in the due course of the 15,000, was it years or days? Let's go back and look at that. That they, uh, they would have taken to otherwise do the calculations by hand. Maybe they would have gained the wisdom to know not to complete that if um, the end of the universe, the stars extinguishing themselves upon the manifestation of all nine billion names of God, uh, you know, would have happened. So they, I, I thought it was a very, let's see, Let's see. Oh yeah, 15,000 years. What would have taken us 15,000 years, it will be able to do in a few hundred days. That's, uh, so it is years. So that's, that's actually a very plausible scenario, I feel like, because if you extrapolate just the immense technological growth in the last century, that's a hundred years. Multiply that by 150. You know, we have 150 of those um, to be 15,000 years. And that would be in a really uh, hard to even unfathomable, really unfathomable technological progress. So um, we can only hope that we evolve spiritually as much as we're evolving and uh, innovating technologically as well. So, I don't know, I used to be really skeptical about um, the spirituality and hyper-spirituality, and I, I think the human mind in, in all matters of, of, you know, the mind and spirit and um, religion is so complex that it's easy for a lot of, I think it's more easy in a lot of ways for charlatans, snake oil salesmen, and um, just generally bad actors, dishonest, self-interested people to capitalize on the um, both the thirst, the, the desire for more information, more knowledge about the human mind and, and spirit and the cosmological significance of the human beings and um, the complexity and, and the convoluted, you know, terminology and, and um, ideas that you're bound to run into when, when you're diving deep into consciousness and the nature of consciousness. So, I think that's what gives it a bad rap, in other words. I think there's a lot of um, great, honest, uh, genuine, candid, sincere devotees and followers and seekers of truth in the religious and spiritual domains. And that might be why he actually used the example of a Lama, because the Dalai Lama is almost the epitome of what we view as an actually nat um, pure, a spiritually pure individual. Um, I don't think I've ever really heard, yeah, actually, I don't think I've ever heard anyone smear the Dalai Lama's name. I can't imagine, I can't remember any instance where I've ever heard him doing anything dishonest. Uh, I don't know if I can say the same about the Pope. Definitely not in the history of Popes. There's uh, a lot of dirt. I don't know about any recent Popes, so I don't follow that closely enough. But the... I don't know. I, I like this story because it really makes you think. It's, of course, quick, but it, the ending is... Um, it's deep. It's the imagery of looking up at something timeless, constant like the one thing in this world I mean mountains move oceans drop um, climates change temperatures fluctuate 
we have seasons uh nothing on earth is really nearly as static as the stars i mean even the sun um you know it gets it gets blocked out by the moon occasionally but the stars every single night if there's no clouds from the earth you know those are that's a blockage from the earth the stars themselves never seem to change excepting the occasional supernova that we might see so the stars are a symbol of constancy and like a baseline from which we, we reference all other motion and uh, you know brightness even in the universe and to the imagery of looking up on a and especially being in, in a um, such a spiritually saturated and overwhelmingly natural uh, environment like the, the Tibetan mountains and looking up on a crisp clear night when it said it was really cold it referenced being cold especially in the story which I think was a nice little detail you know foreshadowing that's the word I was looking for what was about to happen it's very cold and they look up and all of a sudden the one thing we can rely on and we've relied on for millions billions of years who knows how long we've you know at least mammals I don't know about lizards and dinosaurs but I'm certain that some monkey 10 million years in the past looked up and there was like Arthur C. Clarke's uh, 2001 an initial imprint of the majesty and the, the mystery of the nighttime sky and the stars and, and what, what that means and how far away and how large that might be and what that tells us what, what that says about our place in the universe and just looking up and imagine seeing that after millions of years of that almost being burned into our psyche which I really think it is and just seeing them start to pop out of existence that um, it's deep it's deep it's a it's a memorable image for sure so and uh, one last thing I, I think I want to mention is the deep connection between language and mathematics and of course language um, predates written history and writing uh, who knows how many tens of thousands of years but uh, the oral traditions carried on through the spoken word were certainly developed very uh, in a very sophisticated manner before they were written down in around the world you know um, after Christ and, and in many cases in India in particular I want to bring up um, you know I, I don't know when they came up with the writing but um, the Ayurvedic was it Ayurvedic texts and um, the Upanishads the Bhagavad Gita there's apparently a long-standing tradition in this book called creators of mathematical and computational sciences here on page 127 it says the Kerala school of astronomy and mathematics um, was founded by Madhava and they came up with many many ideas such as about two centuries before Newton and, and Leibniz created the calculus which is um, in a serious way like the, they're the shoulders upon which Einstein and, and everybody else who were great innovators and inventors and physicists and scientists um, that allow the technological era that we exist in today to uh, exist but these guys independently and way centuries before those European counterparts they developed concepts that were ancient even to them 
in the 1300s around then, um, such as infinite series expansions, power series, trigonometric series like sine, cosine, arc tangent, tangent, um, approximations of infinite forms, differentiation, integration, which is calculus. Uh, tons of things. I mean, approximating pi and how to, you know, get the circumference of a circle. And I bring this up because in India in particular, which is what uh, Arthur C. Clarke was very familiar with, there's a, what does it say here? The relation between language and mathematics in, is an ancient Indian tradition. And before there's a proper mathematics, and, and I think even in India is where we get the concept of zero from. We definitely, European math would, would be, would lack a lot if it didn't have, it wasn't informed by Indian ideas, mathematical concepts. And in the West, this is becoming an interesting idea I want to further explore in the future, uh, we, we make a very sharp distinction between logic and mathematics and, um, you know, the liberal arts and uh, writing and, and, and fiction and art in general and, and language. But what we don't recognize, there's, you know, our minds, uh, language says a lot about the way we think because obviously we, our minds, evolved uh, the use of language. And so clearly language is a, uh, an insight into how our minds think. In the, the grammar and the syntax that we use gives us insight into the trains of thought and, and the processes which go on in our mind. And they're like the externalized vocalizations of our um, internal monologues and stuff. It's interesting to think like what we, how humans thought. We must have all thought in images before we... Uh, actually had words that we could kind of think to ourselves and speak to ourselves. Um, it must have been very emotional in an in integration of emotions and, you know, images and memories and, and uh, experiences before we had the proper language. But that's all to say that there is a deep connection in Arthur C. Clarke's vision that coming up and just naming gods, nine billion names of God, would complete some kind of maybe circuit or something uh, that would connect in, in some profound, cosmologically significant way. Because, you know, we, we are a part of the universe, so in essence that's our connection to God. I mean, God is, is the universe, or even if it, it, it is beyond the universe, it's still... Um, in really any definition of God, it's it's the causal influence on the universe. So whatever our nature is, is in a religious, spiritual sense, very bound, tightly bound with the nature of God. So whether we are a part of God or we are the creation, the, the stuff of the whatever the analogy of God's thinking would be, um, we, in our consequent inventions like language and tools and mathematics, is, are, are ways to kind of follow breadcrumbs as far as learning about the nature of our own minds. And so spiritual texts might not be as explicit in their mathematical formulations, but they are the seeds out of which our math and um, what we think of as separate rational scientific thought is is has flourished and so we have to pay proper credence you know i mean it's like uh i don't know what a good analogy would be but uh Yeah, I guess I don't really have an analogy for that. But 
there's I think the ultimate theory the thesis of uh, last thing I would like to say is just that the there's depths of conscious knowledge in religious very ancient religious texts that we would do well to revere and um, for continue to further explore before we just threw them out as superstition and irrelevant to our modern lives the thought that we that the culture and technologies that we thrive off today and rely upon are built very firmly on top of these spiritual religious foundations out of which you know which, which we developed over millions if not at least hundreds of thousands of years in the wild in true raw nature under the stars and um, to me it's very significant to heed some of the wisdom that we might be able to gain from these distilled poems and, and narrations and texts and contemplations on our own nature, our consciousness, and uh, whatever relation that might have with a deity such as a monotheistic god. So, um, I think this story had a lot more to say than just a surface gloss of saying, oh, it was just deus ex machina at the end, saying that, you know, the writing out nine billion names of God is, uh, it is just a complete fabrication and just a, you know, a trivial little, uh, surprise ending to a short story. I think this story could definitely be made into a, an elaborate novel, science fiction novel. It has very fertile seeds of uh, recognizing that they, he made a point, a very careful point to, point to say that they invented their own alphabet. It wasn't just the European alphabet. Um, they took centuries to you know, carefully develop a an alphabet out of you know who knows how much intense uh, meditation and introspection. You know, because uh, although we have a very hard, you know, very solid universe that we live in externally, internally, I think we have an equally real and vast universe in each of our minds and the connection of which is uh, probably is going to bring about unknown and amazing phenomena I think um, meaning if we work in concert if we cooperate and we explore our minds in the universe mutually we're much more potent and capable in uh, together than we are alone um, and who knows what meditation what insights deep spiritual reflection can actually yield so anyways I think it was a great short story full of like I said very um, very promising very rich ideas very um, engaging ideas that provoke imagery that is quite beautiful, I think. I hope you guys enjoyed it too. And uh, thanks for watching.